It's given by Professor Willem Mulder, who works at the University Hospital in Amsterdam and in New York at Mount Sinai. He will be talking about turn-on-sig nanomedicine in cancer and a little bit about atherosclerosis. Willem, please. Okay, so, so um, the title of the talk is uh, indeed Theranostics um, in Cancer and Atherosclerosis. Um, I'll be really brief about atherosclerosis because normally I give talks about atherosclerosis. If, if you like this, you can read this review. So I'm going to skip the cardiovascular disease for this talk and focus on, on two recent studies that we published. So uh, as Ton already laid out, uh, uh, the combination of therapy and diagnostics, also referred to as, as teranostics. I'm, I'm not very excited about that term, but you know, let, let's use it for the, uh, for the sake of this session. And so in general, the application of nanoparticles in oncology can be for targeted therapy or target, targeted diagnostics, but you could also in some ways combine it. Um, and I'm going to show you two, two examples of how to com combine imaging and nanomedicine to, um, to either improve nanoparticle drugs or to, um, um, to be able to identify patients who will be amenable for a nanoparticle therapy. So this is a slide with an overview of different imaging modalities. I'll skip CTs, not very relevant for Theranostics, um, although it's a very functional um, anatomical imaging modality. Then we go to MRI, um, which is actually semi-suitable for molecular imaging, uh, but mostly it gives beautiful soft tissue um, contrast and then gives very, very nice anatomical images. But I'll focus on first on optical imaging, how to integrate that to improve nano drugs, and then I'll uh, transfer to, uh, to nuclear imaging. So one of the key aspects that sometimes or often is not taken into account is that these nano drugs are not bricks. Right? It's not like this thing will stick together. It's usually self-assembled structures that once you um, administer them systemically, um, there's some early work done by, uh, by two postdocs in a the lab. There's a lot of stuff ongoing. So upon an intravenous administration of a self-assembled nanoparticle, they don't only accumulate in the tumor, but will interact with, with um, uh, MPS, with liver and spleen. And while they're circulating, they can interact with uh, pl plasma constituents like uh, lipoproteins and plasma proteins. And, and this is something that really has to be taken into account. And so what we did, we systematically studied the effect of the compatibility of a drug with a nanoparticle and then its in vivo behavior. And to, to, to enable this, we developed FRET technology, faster resonance energy transfer, and it looks like this. Let me go to the next slide. And so we label a nanoparticle with a green dye, then the model drug is the red dye, and when they're in close proximity, so when the drug is inside the particle, we'll see energy transfer. It's a, it's a fluorescent energy, um, resonance energy transfer. Once the model drug releases from the particle, and we excite the nanoparticle itself, we see the direct emission of the light of the nanoparticle itself. So there's no energy transfer. And so this allows us, here I showed it in green and red, we tuned this to the near infrared so, so we're able to do actual in vivo experiments. And so then we took the model drug, in this case it was size seven, and then we started derivatizing this model drug and to make it more compatible, in this case with PLGA pack nanoparticles, so polymeric nanoparticles. So on the left is as the lowest compatibility, and then we started increasing the lipophilicity of these drugs, and ultimately we even put in a small polymer, um, and that increases the compatibility of the drug with the nanoparticle platform. And through this FRET imaging, we can look at the release of the drug. Yeah, and then we get an experiment like this. So we inject these dual-labeled nanoparticles. They accumulate in the tumor, and then we can do exactly the same. So if the drug is associated with a nanoparticle and we do this FRET imaging uh, through near-infrared imaging, we'll see a FRET signal. When the drug releases from the nanoparticles in the tumor, then the FRET signal disappears. And so this allows us to do in vivo imaging of drug release from these nanoparticles. And we can do this with whole body near infrared imaging. It's a little bit of a busy slide, so I won't go over the details. But what you'll may be able to appreciate is that in these cases, so this is the FRET channel. So we excite the nanoparticle and we look at the emission of light um, from the drug. And what you see that here, we see more efficient delivery than in, in this instance. 
And so, and then we can look at these different channels and you can look at the ratios of the donor acceptor and then, you know, you can actually model a little bit how the drug releases from the particle. And what we've s s seen a lot is that when we inject these nanoparticles, the drug releases immediately, so before it even reaches the tumors. Now, so, we also did intravital microscopy in the sake of um, time. I'm, I'm not showing any, any of these data, but from all these in vivo data, we derived guidelines. And these guidelines are projected here. So what you see on the left is that we can increase uh, lipophilicity, so hydrophobicity, and we can increase miscibility. And using this combination, we can increase the compatibility of a drug for a nanoparticle platform. The problem is like when you're doing this with an active drug, so you're going to conjugate functional groups to the active drug, it may change the therapeutic properties of the drug. So we had to put in place um, a pro-drug approach. So in this case, we, we implemented this for doxorubicin and, and through a um, pH, at lower pH cleavable linker, we link these, the same groups as for the imaging study. And so we have different degrees of compatibility. But once these nanoparticles accumulate in the tumor and there's a slightly lower pH, ultimately we'll recover doxorubicin. And so uh, the functional group to make the drug itself more compatible with the nanoparticle does not compromise the therapeutic efficacy. So when you do an in vivo experiment with these three um, uh, derivatives incorporated, you clearly see the effect of making the drug more compatible with the nanoparticle platform because what you see there in blue is massively more accumulated in the tumor than the one on the left. This is an order of magnitude difference. And this translates in improved um, therapeutic efficacy and um, animal survival. And so here I don't give, give an example that's clinically viable, at least it's an example where you can nicely see how you can use it to improve it and target the therapy. Then we'll go to Terranostics. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do this quickly, but I, I'm, I call the Terranostic Christmas tree paradigm. So let's say we have a nanoparticle therapeutic, maybe with a targeting agent on top, this looks beautiful, you know, we don't have to change this. But what we want to do, or what's currently going on in this terranostic field is that, you know, let's have, let's say this is doxorubicin loaded nanoparticle with a targeting moiety. Then you start including all kinds of imaging labels. It looks like this, which really compromises the beauty of the Christmas tree, if you ask me. Um, and what we do in the nano terranostic field is then we also try to put all these properties in one small nanoparticle. Um, as is shown here. So um, this may not be a really good idea. Um, so what we started working on with uh, uh, Tom Reiner from MSK uh, is on radio labeling of nanoparticles. The, of course, this is totally out of scale, right? So the, in this case, the, the radioisotope is zirconium-89, which is tiny as compared to the nanoparticle. But what you don't want to do is take a clinical grade compound and then perform chemistry on a clinical grade compound. So this is something we published actually um, um, last Monday, a week ago, and what we refer to the, this as a nano reporter. So what we do is we take hospital, hospital grade doxil, we get it from the hospital pharmacy, and then we make a nano reporter that does not contain doxil, but in composition and size um, and physical chemical properties is very similar to doxil and is radio labeled with zirconium 89. And so when you do a co-administration of your radio-labeled nanoreporter and doxil, get accumulation in the tumor, and then if you quantify doxorubicin and quantify the um, radioisotope, the activity, you see there's a beautiful correlation. And so it's not necessary to actually label dox doxil in this case. You can just use a companion diagnostic. Um, okay, so that, that was ex vivo, and we also looked at if this works in vivo, so here you see a mouse with a tumor that has little accumulation of the nano report or lots of accumulation of the nano report, and then when you sacrifice these animals, you can get these calibration curves where you see this is doxorubicin accumulation in a tumor, and this is based on in vivo PET imaging. You see this really nice correlation. And you can use this graph as a calibration curve to do the following. So now we can um, estimate the accumulation of doxil in, this, in, in these tumors based on a single non-invasive uh, imaging PET uh, session. And so here you see three examples of mice that have varying degrees of tumor accumulation. 
Then here we have our calibration curve, so we can derive the actual uh, quantity of doxorubicin that has accumulated in the tumor on an individual basis. So we did this for all these mice. And then we subdivided the mice that had more than 25 milligrams per kilogram uh, doxorubicin accumulated in their tumors through doxil and less. Um, and that's what you see here. So we have placebo-treated animals, animals that had accumulated more than 25 milligrams per kilogram doxil, less than 25 uh, milligrams per kilogram doxil. And then if you look at the relative tumor growth, you see that our nano reporter actually can predict what animals will perform well as compared to, uh, to animals that had less accumulated or had a lower dose. So this, it's very useful because now we can look at this uh, look at this on an individual basis. And again, this also translates in, in prolonged survival. Um, this nanoreporter, which is a liposomal-based nanoreporter, it also works for other long-circulating nanoparticles. So it works for nanoemulsions. See very nice correlation. It works for PEC PLJ. Also see a very nice correlation. And our last, um, well, we have been actually um, investing a lot in this to, to translate this type of technologies, radio labeling of ther therapeutic nanoparticles to large animal models. Um, we have a unique opportunity at Mount Sinai to work with a PET MRI system. It's integrated PET MRI, so you get MRI, you get your anatomical information, and with PET, we can get the nanoparticle uh, biodistribution. And we've done this on, on non-human primates. So these are monkeys. Here in these gray values, you can see the anatomical information, and then we can look at the nanoparticle biodistribution by, by PET, and it gets really beautiful images. Um, yeah, then with that, I'll conclude the talk. I need to acknowledge a bunch of people, and um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Great talk. Kasi, please. I like your lecture. But the, the main reason is that, you know, for years, many years, we in the dog field and others field, ambisome, so on, all the liposomal things, we're looking for a way to get a dose response curve. And one of the problems is that the dose, the dose that you injected is not really the dose you are looking for. You look for the response related to the dose that reached the site of the inflammation of the tumor and so on. <clears throat> and based on what you show us, you have a way to get a real dose response curve. Yeah, so the, uh, but that was exactly the idea, right? And then obviously there's also, um, we're also thinking about combining this with diffusion weighted MRI uh, because there's, it's not just accumulation, it's also then subsequent ability of, of, of the drug to, 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 move. to move throughout the tumor tissue. So that will be a uh, next refinement. <coughs> yeah. so I think that's really a step function in improving diagnostics and understanding of, of how nanoparticles really works in vivo. Yeah. Thank you. More questions, comments? not even efficacy, survival prolongation. And I, I would say there are many steps still in between what is really <coughs> giving better uh, survival or better efficacy, maybe better antitumor activity, is the released amount from the particles. And that is still missing in this dose-response relationship. Well, we, we, because we don't you assume we... that it's for all these uh, doses or whatever to say. Um, okay, so maybe you missed it, but there's also efficacy, right, in terms of tumor growth inhibition. And so it's not only survival. I, I completely agree, don't get me wrong, but, has, but we looked at, but it, it correlates really nicely. It, it seems to be correlated. Yeah, so it, yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 it works pretty well. Uh, but, uh, but I agree, there's a lot of parameters that well, uh, have to take. You have often luck, yeah. <laughs> no, but, but, but like, especially in the context, like, this is supposed to do a cl clinical trial and about 10 or 15 or 20 percent of your patient population actually will benefit from nanoparticle therapy. Suppose you do this trial and 80 percent is not benefiting. Just look at how that will mess up the average of your response and that falsely will accuse nanomedicine of not being very uh, effective. No, I completely agree with uh, that. So, and, and this is a way to... To, to identify patients that more, are more likely to be responsive to. And I think it works pretty well. That's, uh... 
think that's a nice conclusion of this talk. Thank you again, Willem. Yeah.